we now move uh, to our next speaker, who is Ansley Conchola. She's a MD PhD candidate in Chase and Spencer's lab at the University of Michigan Medical School. And Ansley will be talking about her work on stable IPS derived NKX21 long bulb tip progenitor organoids give rise to airway and alveolar cell types. Ansley, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you guys so much for um, joining us today. Thank you, Matthias, for the invitation to share this talk with you all. Um, so yes, as was mentioned, I'm a student in Jason Spence's lab at the University of Michigan, and I'm really excited to share this story with you all today, um, where our group worked on improving and optimizing iPSC-derived lung organoid models that we believe um, better mimic development at a transcriptional and functional level. So before I really get into the story, I wanted to give a shout out to two integral members of this project. Uh, my co-first author, Renee Hines, who is um, sadly leaving us in a few weeks as she's about to defend her thesis, as well as an undergraduate student in the lab, Lexi Fine, who is really instrumental in helping maintain all of our cell cultures and so we could perform these experiments. So as I think everyone here can appreciate, the lung is a really complex organ and must interact intimately with both our internal as well as external environment in order to perform gas exchange, arguably the most critical function for life itself. The lung consists of different tissue types, including the epithelium, which create the airway structures through which air flows, as well as the alveoli where gas exchange occurs, as well as uh, mesenchyme, which surrounds the epithelium and provides key signaling cues as well as structure to the lung. In human, lung development begins as early as four weeks post-conception when anterior foregut endoderm gives rise to this outpouching of uh, epithelium defined by NKX21, which is shown here in blue. And this tissue is also surrounded by mesenchyme, which I'm showing in gray. So this Outpouching begins bifurcating and forming what will become the primary bronchi. And then through a series of iterative divisions during branching morphogenesis, the airways are built to give rise to that beautiful arborized network of the lung that we all appreciate. After about 16 weeks post-conception, the lung begins transitioning to building the alveolar structures, which are those poplar-like sacs that form to support gas exchange. So during lung development, there is a specialized population of lung progenitor cells called bud tip progenitors that reside at the tips of all of those branching airways and will give rise to all of the epithelial cells of the lung. So as the airways bifurcate during branching morphogenesis, bud tip progenitors are left behind proximally, giving rise to a whole array of airway cell types I'm showing here. And then later in development, they will transition to giving rise to the alveolar cells. So in the Spence lab, we're really excited and particularly interested about the bud tip progenitor population. And our lab has previously been successful at culturing primary human bud tip progenitors as an epithelial only organoid um, using media conditions that substitute for those mesenchymal cues of development. However, there are numerous issues with working with primary tissue, including various technical challenges, ethical and regulatory concerns, as well as uh, limited tissue availability. And so for these reasons, our group was really adamant about developing an iPSC derived organoid model um, in order, and as well as taking rigorous steps to benchmark them against our primary uh, organoid counterpo counterparts. Um, we also wanted to leverage new technologies like single cell RNA sequencing that have become widely available more recently um, and use this new insight of development to build on existing protocols to create this more robust model. So we decided to optimize existing differentiation protocols in order to improve our lung organoid model. And while I don't have time to walk through all of the experiments of media optimization that we did, I will highlight some of the main steps of our protocol. So we begin with 2D cell culture of stem cells that are then driven through a definitive endoderm and pattern to foregut uh, over the course of a week. And after day seven, these 3D structures called spheroids actually pinch off from the 2D plate. We collect them, embed them in nature gel, and then continue patterning them into an early lung progenitor identity, 
where we look for expression of that long epithelial marker NKX21. When we compare day 10 spheroids for NKX21 expression by qPCR, we can see a near 100 fold increase in this expression using our new protocol when we compare it to previous protocols across three separate stem cell lines. Additionally, when we com compare these to hindgut derived spheroids, we also see a significant difference as well as with undifferentiated stem cells. One of the uh, cell lines that we use predominantly in this work uh, has an EGFP reporter for NKX21, which we use predominantly for benchmarking our organoids. And here I'm showing a representative image of our day 10 spheroids um, where you can nicely capture that NKX21 EGFP expression. So after the 10-day induction is done, we transition our spheroids into a published bud tip maintenance media that contains FGO7, Chiron, as well as all transretinoic acid. And over the course of several weeks, these spheroids expand and branch into airway-like structures, which we call long progenitor organoids, or LPOs. Again, using our EGFP reporter cell line, we can assess this nice high expression of NKX21 in the LPOs. Uh, we have also performed single cell RNA sequencing of the organoids in order to assess their composition. And while we were excited to see a really high uh, cluster here of cells expressing long epithelial markers, particularly NKX21, but also FOXA2, SOX2, um, as well as many of our canonical bud tip markers that I'm showing here on the bottom, it was actually surprising to see that there was a large majority of cells within these organoids expressing the intestinal epithelial marker CDX2. So we examined our LPOs by immunofluorescence as well. And when we do this, we can identify these large distinct regions of the organoids that appear to be largely lung. So here they're expressing the bud tip marker CPM, SOX9, as well as NKX21. But we also find these large regions of organoids defined by non-lung lineages, particularly, as I mentioned, that uh, intestinal marker CDX2. So here is a region of the organoid expressing high levels of CDX2 in green, and they also seem to be predominantly intestinal epithelial cells, uh, sorry, goblet cells, marked here by MUC2 in green. Additionally, we quantified this contamination using flow cytometry. So we coupled our NKX21 EGFP reporter with a known, um, that known surface bud tip marker CPM and sorted our bud tip progenitors from LPOs across a range of ages, um, as well as early as three weeks in culture all the way out to 17. So we were really encouraged by this trend that with time in this bud tip media, we do see an increase of our double positive cells shown here in purple. However, there were still uh, these contaminating lineages persisting in our culture all the way out uh, to 17 weeks. So we decided to use our sorting strategy um, that I just mentioned to collect our bud tip progenitors, embed them in matrix gel, um, where they then form near homogeneous induced bud tip progenitor organoids or IBTOs. So again, here they're showing nice expression of the bud tip marker CPM and SOX2, as well as the lung epithelial marker NKX21. And we continue to quantify the culture's purity by flow cytometry and determine that bud tip progenitors sorted from older LPOs actually maintain their identity better than those that were sorted earlier, suggesting that time is really playing a critical role in helping reduce the plasticity of these cultures. Once again, we leveraged single cell RNA sequencing to benchmark our cultures. So here at the IBTO stage, we were really reassured to see near homogeneous expression of our lung epithelial markers, as well as the bud tip progenitor markers across our cultures with very minimal CDX2 intestinal contaminating cells present. We also developed a bud tip cell scoring list of about 100 genes in order to further benchmark these cultures. And here we can show that our induced bud tip organoids, the IPSC derived ones, or very similarly to bud tip organoids derived from primary tissue, um, which both score closest to the in vitro, or sorry, in vivo uh, primary tissue bud tip progenitors in comparison to a non-bud tip cell such as basal cells that I'm showing here. 
Functionally, we also wondered if these bud tip organoids were competent for differentiation since this is their primary function in vivo. So we treated our IBTOs with two different published differentia differentiation media uh, in order to test whether they can establish airway or alveolar lineages in vitro. So after the airway induction protocol, we were able to detect a wide array of airway cell types using both immunofluorescence and qPCR. And here I'm just showing a couple highlights. Um, we have multiciliated cells, pulmonary neuroendocrine cells, and secretory cells in culture. With the alveolar induction, we also see expression um, at protein and RNA levels for uh, surfactant proteins B and C, uh, which are key markers of the alveolar cell types. So with that, I'll just summarize what I shared with you all today. Um, so this paper uh, was meant to describe a method that generates bud tip progenitor-like cells from ICSCs that we believe transcriptionally and functionally resemble bud tip progenitors from our primary tissue. We believe that the model can be readily used to further study lung development, um, and as well as provide insights into disease and regenerative studies. And ongoing work in the lab is actually testing transplant experiments to um, put these cells into immunocompromised mice and then uh, test their in vivo competence and function. So with that, I just wanna thank uh, members of our lab that also helped out this project, notably my PI Jason, uh, Renee and Lexi, who I mentioned at the top of the, the talk, other members of the lung team, including Myla, Lindy, and Tristan, and to our computational um, wizard, Z-Way, for all of his help with our single cell analysis. I also want to thank our external collaborators, including the BDRL at the University of Washington for Tissue, the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, as well as the Hinkskirk Lab here at the University of Michigan. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks for a great uh, overview, uh, Ansley. Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. We have time for questions. Uh, while we wait for, for some of your questions, I have one. So you yep. mentioned the similarities of the in vivo progenitors and the in vitro derived ones. What about the, the, the differences in which kind of pathways are actually slightly changed when you derive these cells in vitro? And can you learn from the differences to further improve the culture protocols? That's a great question. Yeah, so we have um, kind of been kind of mining more of that data, both in our lung organoids as well as uh, other organoid models in our lab, including intestinal organoids or alveolar organoids specifically, um, because we do see this kind of in vitro signature that seems to emerge when we do single cell sequencing. Um, that seems to affect all tissues regardless. So um, there are some changes in metabolism, and I think some of that is dependent on uh, the actual media conditions as well of what these different cell types requ require for growth. Um, so they're not necessarily all the same, but we have been working to elucidate a little bit more of what that in vitro signature is since it seems to be present, whether it's a primary direct tissue or an IPSC directed differentiation. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a question from Sebastian uh, Arnold, actually. Uh, did you try to reduce Chiron treatment during early differentiation to generate more anterior foregut and avoid posterior caudal uh, endoderm formation? Yeah, that's a great question. And one of the big outstanding issues with because of all of that intestinal hindgut contamination, we do think that Wnt is the key player here. Um, we have tested other <clears throat> levels of Chiron, um, but a little bit later in the protocol. And actually, um, we ended up replacing Chiron with Wnt and Arspondin specifically to kind of help also um, create something more specific and uh, kind of lessen the, the impact that Chiron was going to have. But unfortunately, we still see this hindgut contamination. Um, we think that there's still room for optimization in that part of the protocol, though. Uh, as well as maybe testing some other signaling pathways, such as hedgehog, et cetera, that might help drive with um, the anterior foregut over um, hindgut. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you have any hypothesis as to why the organoids express intestinal markers? We think um, this is a, obviously like a big question of, because this was a huge issue for us. And um, it was actually really reassuring to see that um, I think 
people are trying to be a little bit more transparent uh, with these protocols recently, which was something we wanted to do as well with our protocol. I think this contamination is actually a more widespread issue um, in the IPSC differentiation field than we've all appreciated before. So um, if there's one reason, I'm not totally clear what that is. As I just kind of answered with Sebastian's question, we think that definitely WINT is, um, you know, attenuating WINT might be a good uh, next step to really kind of drive down that contamination. Um, but it, we also think maybe there's just some maybe default state of these cultures to kind of favor hindgut for some reason. Um, that just might be kind of why we see this happen. Um, but yeah, it's, we're not totally sure why we continue to get hindgut. Mm -hmm. Queen, Queenie uh, Ma is asking or commenting about brilliant work. I'm just wondering for alveolar organoids, have you also seen the lamellar bodies which would su suggest AT2 maturation? That's a great question. Um, I don't recall if we looked at lamellar structures and these organoids specifically. Um, we do have uh, Tristan, who is our alveolar expert in the lab, who helped us perform these experiments doing additional work up on, his, on the alveolar organoids, where I know um, in some other instances, he has been able to generate and we've identified lamellar bodies, um, but we didn't have that for this uh, particular set of experiments. I remember from your, from your manuscript that you tried different uh, protocols to, to propagate the cells and you used one where you use shear forces and that turned out to be the, the best approach. Do you have any uh, hypothesis as to whether mechanics might be, might be involved in, in, in that? Yeah, that's a great question. And yeah, something that we included in the paper, but I didn't really have time to get into today. But yes, we noticed that if we try to passage our organoids using um, finer methods, such as like needle shearing or kind of tearing things apart with our pipette, that seemed to favor the intestinal lineage as well. Um, so we think definitely mechanical forces are at play. Um, so we actually passage these kind of as a whole organoids for extended amounts of time until they get sorted um, into blood tip organoids. But we have also recently been testing complete single cell dissociation for our passaging, and that also seems to favor the lung lineage. So um, something with this mechanical force is playing a role. We don't really know what that is specifically, but it's definitely worth following up on again. Intriguing. Well, thank you very much mm -hmm. uh, for the great discussion also, Ansley. Yep, thank Good you. Job.